back, everyone. We're about to start our first roundtable of the forum, the informal settlement upgrading post COVID-19, moving from upgrading to revitalization and sustainability. And our moderator for the discussion is Habitat's Patrick Kanagasikam. Patrick. Thank you so much, Dean. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, as Dean introduced, my name is Patrick Kanagasingham, and I am the COO for Habitat for Humanity International. Dean introduced the topic, but I just want to emphasize what the topic really means. Informal settlements, upgrading, COVID-19. Huge topic. And we have an esteemed panel I will introduce in a moment. But I just want to start with a problem statement. And the statement is this. More than 1 billion people live in informal settlements or slums. What does that really mean? And I'm going to turn to my esteemed panel. I'm going to introduce each one. And then each one would actually take five minutes to make a presentation. And even as they present, I would really appreciate if the audience could pay heed to some of the salient points that they would reflect on. So what would these points really mean? This particular session actually would be an opportunity for us to learn about the state of the art informal settlement upgrading that's happening in different parts of the world. What we want to do today is just not focus on the problems or the challenges. We also want to focus on the solutions and that includes partnerships. That includes some key outcomes, like how can we co-create some of the solutions? What does it mean in different contexts, in different parts of the world? So with that, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel today. We did share the bios in advance, so I'm not going to take time to go into a level of detail. Our first panelist is Julian Baskin, who is the principal urban advisor for Cities Alliance. We also have Kirsten Summer, who is the slum upgrading unit leader and project leader for participatory slum upgrading program at UN Habitat. We have with us Ajay Suri, who is a senior advisor at the Inclusive Development National Institute of Urban Affairs, India and Professor Christy Patsiri, who is a professor uh, uh, for land management at the National Technical University of Athens. What I'm going to ask right now is in that particular order, starting with Julian, to make an oral presentation. Uh, one of our panelists would also have some slides, uh, i.e. Christy would uh, like to share some slides at the end, uh, but again, the focus would be to focus on the salient points that each panelist would share. So without further ado, over to you, Julia. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, to sit on this panel. In the context of Africa, cities are growing on average at 3.2% per annum, which means that African cities will double in size every 20 years. This hides the fact that many cities are growing much faster and some are doubling in size every 10 years. This is happening at a time when African city governments are institutionally very weak and are unable to respond by providing formal planned land for household settlement. Thus, city growth is predominantly informal. For example, in 2016, Mozambique needed nationally 80,000 sites to manage city growth, but the system of planning only provided an estimated 5,000 formally planned sites, meaning that there's a ratio of one household settled formally to 16 households settled informally. This ratio is reflected in varying degrees across the continent. Today, many cities have 75% of the city population living in informal settlements. Bearing in mind that there are something like 7,600 cities of different sizes in Africa, the challenge is enormous. The post-COVID-19 pending long-term economic crisis will make large investments into human settlements less likely, requiring new approaches to human settlement 
upgrading. Approaches that enable the shift from on-off pilot projects to match the scale of the issue. Approaches that unleash the long-term potential of incremental upgrading. The first and most immediate crisis is not the informality per se, but the environmentally unsuitable nature of the land that is sometimes, oftentimes settled. Informal settlements are often built on the least protected land that includes coastal zones, floodplains, and river banks, all vulnerable areas to climate change and reducing the opportunities for future adaptation. In other cases, informal settlements make the construction of new infrastructure difficult without mass relocation. In Ethiopia and Uganda, cities are responding to the governance gap by refocusing their limited planning capacity away from the defined legal processes that can take five years for a single housing project to materialize. Towards a new approach of land expansion planning that provides for the big picture, including mapping out environmentally hazardous land and ensuring no one settles on it, as well as surveying a future road and services grid that is protected by the planting of trees. In this way, the objective is to provide just enough physical planning to ensure that people do not settle on inappropriate land and will not need to be relocated when a new road or services are constructed. Informal settlements themselves are a physical manifestation of the resilience and innovation of humanity in finding space within the city and building organic affordable settlements that respond to the varied needs of the urban poor. The heart of informal settlement upgrading is to bring together these two approaches. What can the government and its development partners do to support households to improve their own quality of living? Successful slum upgrading is built on the basis of a partnership between the state and the leadership of informal communities. Three key actions not requiring substantial money can be transformative. Firstly, a moratorium on evictions serves as the first step towards security of tenure, enabling communities to invest their own savings into improved housing without fear of having their biggest asset demolished. Secondly, empowering local community leadership to fill the governance gap enables the power vacuum that would normally be filled by criminal, ele by criminal elements and opens the door for partnerships between the local authorities and local leadership. Thirdly, a community-based census and mapping of the settlement, creating both addresses and a register of residents, serves to build a sense of the informal settlement as being part of the formal city and not simply an amorphous crime-ridden slum. In River State, Nigeria, a very popular radio station, Chikoko Radio, further deepens the identity of the settlements as being an integral part of the greater Port Harcourt community. Given the scale of the economic crisis facing Africa, where 95% of new jobs are to be found in the low-paying informal economy, the most cost-effective ways of providing essential services needs to be found. The experience of Slum Dwellers International is that well-organized communities with a little financial support can build and manage their own infrastructure at a fraction of the costs of the state. Angola is an example of a country where community-managed water points ensure both regular maintenance and the collection of service charges to be paid to the National Water Service provider. Finally, housing with informal settlements reflects the fact that by far the most housing in Af by far most of the housing in Africa is built by small scale local contractors, often without any support from the state or market. Simply by providing a range of support services such as technical design assistance, microfinance, access to affordable and sustainable building materials, and basic construction tools, a huge impact on the quality of the housing stock can be achieved using the principle of massive small rather than large scale developer led housing. In summary, the scale of informal settlements is staggering and undermines the opportunities inherent in urbanization. 
but practical, scalable responses can make a huge difference towards realizing more inclusive cities. Thank you very much just for those five minutes. Many thanks, Julian, and I really appreciate you um, both honing, uh, honing in on specific issues, but also keeping to time as well. So you've set the tone. Thank you. And uh, at this point, I would like to ask Kirsten Summer to come on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for this opportunity and just building on what uh, Julian said. Um, the challenges are clearly the scale and also the need to scale solutions in view of the large scale and the commitment for systematic change for integrated urban development. But we want to focus on achievements and hear my statement. Achievements today, um, at global level, I think we can all be proud that we have mandates at hand. But just to remind us, I mean, we have the sustainable development goals and also there for the first time, informal settlements have become an universal issue. Actually, just end of this year, we will for the very first time have a report a data report um, looking at informal settlements globally, so beyond the developing countries, which I think is also a very important um, yeah, starting point. And then we have the new urban agenda with 51 entry points. But we also at regional level, we see informal settlements are in the debate. It's an acute topic. We have uh, regional strategies ongoing with different uh, partners through our ministerial committees. And in all informal settlements, inequality, poverty are high at the agenda, on the agenda. And what we also have as an achievement is that we can make the case that it is possible. We know there's not one approach fits all, but we have uh, diverse ingredients and success stories from all regions, um, which allow us to learn um, from each other and get the right uh, processes, systems in place to actually scale and address the issue. And another one, I think also an important one, is that we have more and more open doors for a participatory, decentralized approach where people are really at the center and also the um, people are recognized and formal settlements are also recognized for um, their assets and also contribution to the informal sector and the sense of the urban economy. COVID-19, as you were saying, has added an extra challenge and also has reminded us in many ways of, well, first of all, the levels of exclusion, inequalities, vulnerabilities from lacking uh, basic services to just not being able to actually integrate in the national responses. I mean, that simply national responses were not relevant to uh, informal settlements, not applicable. And also overall, um, I think it has been a uh, um, great experience also in the sense of, um, while it's obviously a very dramatic global event, that um, there is uh, opportunities and ways of overcoming uh, those exclusion inequalities by um, by applying an equitable approach, by looking in detail, by zooming in, by collecting the data we need, and by designing interventions that meet different needs, and the needs were not the same, and also actually also mobilizing the trust to a partner and, and uh, making our cities overall more um, resilient. So, yeah, COVID-19 was for me also uh, really in uh, our professional context, um, a wake up call and an opportunity to communicate better the, the changes and approaches that also Julian was just talking about because we've just experienced it. We have, ex yeah, we've seen uh, settlements are generally not fitting in and often, I mean, when we hear the words of responses in different areas of, of legalization, formalization, it's often about making them fit in, but it's also recognizing that informal settlements make cities inclusive today and they are the starting point. Um, yeah, again, for the integration, much has been said by Julian, so I don't want to repeat, but just saying that we really need to have in that spirit and all our everyday business, let's say, as practitioners, politicians, um, attention to what is needed to become uh, inclusive urban societies and what kind of instruments we need. You mentioned the co-creation. Uh, so also the importance of 
that we can accelerate with communities. And um, if we have a systematic approach and a long-term vision and the right partnerships, we can go the long way since it's not a quick fix, but really prove and enable everyone and cities to really um, yeah, um, leverage diversity to prosper and empower governments and society at large. Um, thank you. That's my initial message. Thank you, Kirsten. And uh, you said it well when you said this is your initial message because we have a lot more to garner uh, in terms of what you have to say. Uh, but friends, I just want to remind us, uh, one of the things I asked right at the beginning is to pay heed to some key themes that would emerge even as each of the panelists present. And I think it's fair to say we are seeing uh, a consistency as far as these themes that are beginning to emerge. So scale is becoming a specific issue that we need to talk about today. The other piece that Kirsten just reminded us, uh, which is equally important, particularly in the midst of COVID, is this whole concept of exclusion versus inclusion or the other or vice versa, is that it's still a challenge and we need to address that as well, particularly as we talk about informality and COVID, what COVID has done has further amplified some of the issues that are emerging. So with that, uh, Ajay, uh, I would invite Ajay Suri uh, to present next. Over to you, Ajay. Thank you very much. And thanks to Habitat for Humanity for the kind invite to the panel discussion today. Uh, during my very brief oral presentation, I would like to discuss three key issues which are community action, community database, and the linkage between tenure and service improvement. Let me start with the problem statement. A number of 1 billion slum dwellers was mentioned by you. Uh, I, I believe uh, a few tens of millions must have been added to the number since the last estimate. But more importantly, a large percentage of these slum dwellers are housed in Asia, particularly the three middle income countries, which are India, Indonesia, and China. Uh, besides the number, I believe the problem is that the cities at large across regions are yet to accept informal settler families as legitimate citizens, an integral part of the city's value chain. This is reflected in the general apathy of the service providers to the needs of the slum dwellers. In response, the informal settler communities, again across cities at large, across regions, have increasingly accepted the fact that state is unable or unwilling to discharge its responsibility and mandate of providing various segments of the city population with equitable access to public services, including urban services and social facilities. Facing this situation, the slum communities could either wait forever for the state delivery, or they could make efforts to either partner with service providers or on their own create micro service networks at the settlement level. The trend, fortunately, is increasingly in the favor of the latter. The community efforts vary between the two options, communities procuring land and creating settlement level networks and or partnering with service providers and contributing labor and or finances for improved services. It is a wide spectrum of such initiatives across countries and regions. Good example in Asia are many. The highlights include the public-private people partnership model for in-situ rehabilitation of slum dwellers in Mumbai using land as a resource, community-led redevelopment in Thailand, the Kodi model, and the Kampung Improvement Program in Indonesia, and lastly, women procuring land and creating network services in Yangon. The backbone, however, of all community-led slum upgrading initiatives is the creation of settlement-level database by the communities themselves, whether for negotiating with the city authorities for services, or for planning and implementing slum improvement programs. Such databases have evolved from household enumeration and settlement footprints on maps not to scale to now use of open source platforms for GIS, 
uh, mapping with attribute data related to service level benchmarks. The success of the practice is indicated by the increasing confidence of various stakeholders in the database developed by slum communities and its use for service improvement initiatives. Various large sized urban improvement programs being implemented in mission modes, such as those in India and Indonesia show that these programs continue to be exclusionary and bypass the informal settlements. Uh, despite the stated prog program objectives of promoting inclusive city development, the city level service providers fail to cover the informal settlements due to lack of policy directives on tenure issues. The absence of ownership rights deems the uh, settlements as illegal and thus ineligible for coverage under service improvement programs. The tenure status is seen as no legal rights or full ownership rights, the black or white scenario. The policy directors, directives are missing. The wide spectrum of gray options between the two extremes of de jure status. Exploring the de facto tenure options will help dealing service provision from tenure status of slum settlements. Julian had mentioned of the moratorium on post evictions. My experience in Asia says that even if the land owning agencies can give an undertaking that there would be no post eviction for a period of seven to 10 years, the communities themselves invest in upgrading the settlements, both public services as well as private houses. Uh, let me end here, but I'll be happy to field questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ajay. And again, I just want to recognize you honoring uh, you know the discretion around time that I asked at the beginning, so I really appreciate it. Uh, please hold on to many of the thoughts that you shared with us. Uh, definitely, the policy discourse is a big piece that we we need to talk about. Uh, but you again underscored what's emerging when it comes to inclusion, uh, exclusion, particularly when you talk about the legitimacy of slum dwellers as legitimate citizens. That's such a big piece. So thank you for that. Uh, so right now, without further ado, uh, I'm just going to invite our uh, final panelist, uh, Chrissy Patsy, who is also going to share uh, a, f a couple of slides with us. So over to you, Chrissy. OK. Um, I try to share my screen. Um, please tell me if you can uh, see. Can you see? Not as yet, Chrissy. Oh. I'm sorry because before it worked well. Uh, terrible. Oh, that's OK. Uh, I'm just wondering if. Uh, then if I can uh, keep on. OK, uh, so it's, it's just yeah. come up. It's just coming up, yeah. Ah, is it? Ah, that's good. Excellent. I think it is coming up. I see something emerging, so I'm just hoping it's it's your it's your presentation. Well, can I start now uh, informing you? And uh, if uh, if you see it, then it will be good. Sure, go ahead. Inform Please. me when you when it comes. Good deal. <laughs> OK, I can I so, can see it. On oh, screen. thank you. Thank you very much. So um, the plan for today for me, uh, first of all, I, I really thank you for including me in this uh, forum and I congratulate you all for all your efforts and achievements. And um, the plan for me was to pre to present you uh, the activity of UNEC in terms of uh, formalizing informal settlements and in terms of uh, developing the COVID-19 recovery action plan. Um, so it is a joint work there, not only of, of the three authors, but of a whole bunch of people, experts, um, international experts in that field. Um, what we really um, where we are at the moment is that um, we have um, 
actually we have developed um, a research since 2007 and you can see here we have three publications can you see here the self-made cities the formalizing of informal and the guidelines so these are um, uh, the, this is the work that we had already managed to do just before COVID-19 has appeared and we have tried to, um, to give instructions to our countries and our, uh, the experts and um, all involved um, experts how to, to formalize the informal constructions in our region uh, of these 1 billion uh, residents of informal um, settlements globally we have 50 million uh, estimated in uh, UNEC so we were just at the states uh, to to give uh, when we gave information to to people how to develop a strategy how to develop um, uh, the legal framework and how to develop uh, how to actually proceed with formalizing informal constructions we emphasized the um, on the fact that uh, it is really important to have um, inclusivity in property registration and also of residents. Um, and the value of, um, of uh, having a, a land administration system that will include all constructions, all informal and formal constructions of this region, uh, because maybe sometimes uh, uh, we have also legal and uh, legal uh, constructions inside the informal uh, settlements. Uh, we have um, a, a big variety uh, of informal settlements. The, the majority is not slums though. Uh, so we gave them information how to develop the formalization zones and how to develop the strategy, how to develop the legal framework and how to, to empower people uh, by through registration and by um, and, and empowering the legal rights on on their uh, property first this and, and then also how to to empower the government uh, by having inclusivity in registration so to have to build a, a, a geospatial data infrastructure with all necessary information in order to be able to provide evidence-based um, decision making and to provide humanitarian support when necessary and all that and then in parallel to use all this information to develop local disaster risk reduction plans for any kind of, of disaster and according to the risk of um, uh, of its um, informal settlement because the, the situation varies from uh, country to country and from informal settlement to informal settlement. So uh, then came ca um, COVID-19 came along and we immediately started to develop the um, um, the, um, the recovery action plan from COVID uh, for informal settlements, uh, which is accompanied by uh, a bunch of policy briefs of, on uh, specific topics. For example, you see here food, nature-based solutions, water and sanitation, urban mobility, etc. And the concept is that we have the recovery action plan. Um, I will give you a little bit of the structure and then we have uh, um, city assessments and then we develop the city pandemic risk reduction plan according to the risks that we identify in its um, in its uh, city or in its settlement. Now the structure of the recovery action plan um, is as following. We have nine policy areas you see here. Um, we have the policy area one about geospatial land rights, uh, land tenure. To, it is important, to, as already mentioned, to um, stop evictions and empower people and empower legal rights also where possible, or um, have proper allocation, etc. Then policy area two is involvement of local communities. Again, very very important, as you said, uh, you, you said earlier, chair. Uh, 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 how to build the partnerships with the society and all um, uh, leaders in the society, um, and it is really important how to, to build the political support and the social support for doing all this. And then uh, policy area three is about basic data needs and telecommunication and uh, information technology and how to, to build all this geospatial data infrastructure, which is important. Then four is about how to build physical infrastructure what to improve um, uh, all services, uh, uh, networks, sanitation, um, uh, water, energy and all that. Uh, policy area five uh, uh, about social infrastructure service, uh, 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 services. Then uh, policy area six uh, um, 
all, all these necessary measures for COVID, the state home recommendations, to how to, to, to deal with cultural issues and uh, the vulnerable groups, etc. Uh, policy area seven about food and uh, basic consumption and distribution during the COVID. Um, Policy area eight about environmental concerns, how to allocate the uh, safe green areas or the areas that are not very safe uh, during the pandemic period that uh, accumulate a lot of people, or, or, or etc. And uh, policy area nine um, to deal about the buildings, to identify the buildings that are um, uh, uh, accumulate a lot of people and uh, need uh, ha to have some uh, immediate uh, interventions uh, for COVID. And then uh, all kinds of uh, construction improvements and land planning improvements that need to be done for COVID and especially for COVID. And um, uh, then uh, uh, under these um, um, under these um, policy areas, we have one main goal, and then we have the targets, individual targets, and actions how to do things. And, uh, as it was said before, it, it is very important to have a systematic approach. And of course, because this is um, a, a, a big inventory of what needs to be done to improve informal settlements, we have tried to, to classify a little bit according to the timing. Um, and we have used different colors. You see here red, short term, intermediate term, long term goals. Um, and these are not actually what is uh, the, the priority uh, uh, to be done, but, but what can be done very fast. And uh, we have, um, because also for COVID, but also in general for formalization procedures, politicians want to have quick wins and it is important. And so we, we have some, um, we marked with red those that um, actions that uh, they can be accomplished in less than six months. And some of them are really urgent for the pandemic, especially. And uh, then uh, some short term that can be accomplished in less than one year. The intermediate that can be accomplished uh, that require six to 18 months and then some long term goal, goals that um, maybe need more than a year. Maybe often they need one to five years to be accomplished. Uh, and, and then people can can choose. I'm not going to go into detail. This is uh, the policy area one where you can see the goal and then the, the different tar targets and actions that need to be done. But I'm not going to go into detail with that because um, what I, I really think is that um, the concept is that we should not have the same strategy for every settlement. Um, the, uh, in parallel with um, building the property registration system and the registration of uh, people because people also work informally and live informally there and this is very very uh, big problem big challenge they cannot even take um, any kind of uh, support for covid they, they cannot have access to any any even uh, to uh, to the banks or whatever uh, anyway so in parallel Sorry, with empire Hi, yeah. Chrissy. Uh, I'm because you're getting into the next segment of what I was hoping that we could discuss. Ah, OK. Can I, can I kindly ask yes, maybe yes, yes. if you could summarize because I'm sure yes, you yes. have. That, that's what I was trying to do to summarize. Um, actually, the concept is that to, to register, to develop the inventory and then to have the local uh, disaster risk authority to the pandemic disaster risk reduction plan. This is uh, the concept of what we are doing. That's it. Many thank thanks. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's yes, very yes, comprehensive. Yes. And uh, again, you touched on some of the key elements that other panelists have also, uh, uh, you know, uh, mm. covered with mm. us this morning. I'm or oh, this afternoon, I should say. Uh, it's still morning for me. Uh, can I kindly ask uh, if? You, yeah, thank you. So the presentation is off. Uh, friends, one of the things I want to say is that we did share three questions in advance uh, with uh, all the panelists. Uh, and to their credit, they actually, each of them at different levels, covered the three questions. But just for the benefit of the audience, I think it's pertinent for me to actually state the questions before we get into the discussion, because they, again, uh, made sure that they aligned their respective presentations with the questions that we posed. So the first question was this. 
what has already been achieved in different regions of the world in terms of informal settlement upgrading, and where does this subject stand in the post-COVID-19 scenario? And again, without exception, all four covered this. The second question that we posed was, what are some best practices and successful examples of informal settlement upgrading worldwide? And what lessons can be taken from them? So we heard it at two different levels. There was a macro level response, but there was also a very contextualized regional response as well. And I would really like us to have a conversation with some of the examples that were shared with us. The third question, of course, was what are the existing challenges and impediments and what concrete action, actions should be implemented in order to achieve the desired outcomes? So I'm really going to use the third question uh, as a platform for us to have a conversation. And what I picked up this morning, and this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, but for the sake of a conversation, what I picked up was definitely without exception, scale became very prominent in all this. The second piece that I picked up, which is equally, equally compelling, is about, in, particularly in the COVID world, is inclusion versus exclusion. What does that really mean? And at least a couple of you touched on both the policy discourse as well as the needed legal framework that uh, I would consider critical success factors, even as we look for durable solutions. The third one was really around some of the practical solutions to help it scale, and that entails innovation as well. So what I'm going to do is this. With my first question, I'm going to do a lightning round, meaning I'm not necessarily looking for a very comprehensive response, but I would really appreciate, because there's so much richness to what each of you shared, is I'm just going to go around and ask the question around scale. And this is what I would like us to talk about. If you could help us understand and appreciate what did scale look like pre-COVID and what does it look like when we talk about recovery? Again, scale. We understood scale pre-COVID. What has changed in the midst of COVID and what would post-COVID really look like? Ajay, can I start with you, please? Thanks very much. Let me take the first crack at it. Well, let me give you the example from India. Uh, all of us read about reverse migration uh, as a part of the COVID, whereby the migrants uh, were moving back from cities to smaller towns, smaller hometowns, or rural areas. What was the policy impact of the government of India to this demonstrated? housing vulnerability of the migrant population, they immediately re realized that the, are the, this is the vulnerable uh, segment of the population. And they came up with what they called the affordable rental housing program. And they realized that there is the need to pro uh, provide them with affordable housing accommodation. That's one. But how is also linked to economic vulnerabilities. And that is where this rental housing program with a development package for the informal sector workers. Can you hear me or no? So we, you're breaking up a little bit, Ajay. Uh, I'm not sure whether you have, uh, I think you're using a headphone, but if you could maybe be closer to the microphone, that might be helpful. Let me also switch off my video so that my internet then, uh, the strength would improve. Actually, you're, you're okay now. Okay. Well, I was mentioning, you know, uh, what has changed post-COVID, and I was narrating the example from India, whereby all of us had read about the reverse migration, the migrant labor force moving back from the bigger cities to their hometowns, which could be the smaller cities or the rural settlements. And the government of India responded to this urgent situation, and they realized that the migrant population is both vulnerable both from housing and economic perspective and to address the challenge they came up with a rental housing program whereby subsidized uh, uh, rental housing would be provided to the migrant population and complemented this with the development package for the informal sector workers when i say development package it was not only financial inclusion but better 
integration of these this workforce with the city value chain i i hope i responded to your question uh, if you want me to give more examples and you have the time i could do that no thanks ajay i think definitely very relevant uh, example we probably would come back to this when we also talk about the policy discourse as well but just hold on to that uh, Kirsten, can I kindly turn to you at this point? So it's the same question again, and I would really love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you know, you also made a very compelling argument, even when you talk about the new urban agenda and the various entry points. And I would love to hear how you and Habitat is thinking about this, you know, having probably envisioned this, you know, pre-COVID and what COVID has really done to shape some of the thinking as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it has created momentum to put housing again at the center of our discussions. And I mean, the previous uh, intervention was just speaking to that and we heard before the consequences. We really felt what it means to have inadequate housing conditions from evictions to um, yeah, social protection issues to lack of access to education. Many children could not. There's no, you know, the digital divide. There are so many dimensions to vary depending on the context we're talking about and many of our partner countries, also the lack of access to water for hand washing and enough space in uh, markets and local crowded situation to but the spread. But now, what does it mean? I mean, um, poverty levels have increased and uh, vulnerabilities have increased and also tension in communities has increased. Uh, at the same time, as I was mentioning from before, also community social infrastructures have shown their value. I mean, again, to also talk about the positive, they have been entry points and uh, we heard um, examples of community led actions really where communities were working close with local authorities. And for us, that was also like, let's say at global level, an important lesson that local authorities are key players sitting between national response and um, uh, being in touch with communities. So local authorities together with communities, together with additional partners, NGOs, CBOs, private sector, have really shown also the power of uh, transformation and um, resilience in such situations and um, yeah and these are exactly also the entry points um, as one example since it's a snapshot for uh, for the way forward it's important to keep that dialogue going and these networks and social infrastructure that has been created during this momentum and uh, support those and scale those and use them as entry points as we heard for basic service provision for also connectivity in the sense of uh, uh, mobility and more integration also in socioeconomic recovery measures, as we heard also some examples where we connect a community with um, private sector, create uh, jobs, look at also labor intensive approaches of improving infrastructure, like different ways of doing. And at the same time, also being even more careful with the finance we have at hand because it's been more limited. So also looking at how we do things in the sense of how can we design also implementation delivery mechanisms again with community in the driving seat to reduce costs um, and also looking at building materials and the big broader discussion um, for um, yeah green, sustainable, um, inclusive and affordable uh, recovery process and a process that can contribute to closing the gap rather than increasing the gap now in the socioeconomic recovery process. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kirsten. And uh, I would uh, encourage you to hold on to that thought about partnerships because I want to come back to it even as we look for some pragmatic solutions around scale and how we address the issue around scale. So thank you for that. Chrissy, I'm just going to turn to you at this point, and I know you've done quite a bit of research on this. And okay. What have you discovered in the midst of COVID uh, as far as really the issue around scale is concerned? And it's not so much about the numbers, uh, but if you do have it's numbers, difference. yes. Uh, well, actually, I don't have numbers, but what I know is that many countries in our region, uh, can you hear me well? Many countries in our region had already initiated formalization projects and they had made some progress, good progress, many of them. Uh, however, when COVID appeared, then we have this 
during the pandemic and the post-COVID poverty, the poverty during the pandemic and the post-COVID poverty, which is really hair raising and it will create more poor people. And then this has an impact and, and the life became even more expensive all over. And you can imagine in informal settlements, access to energy is really important. And um, uh, the digital divide is also very important. But the, 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 the big problem is that, as I said, is that these people there in informal settlements, they depend on a daily income. They don't have a stable work and they, they and they come and go. They come into the city, into the, in, the, 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 the COVID has no boundaries, no, no legal boundaries, no physical boundaries. So we have to give priority to all kinds of support to, to the uh, residents of informal settlements. If, first, if we want to get rid of the pandemic, because we are in the midst of the pandemic still, and this is going to be spread all over. So we have to prioritize any kind of humanitarian support to them for the vaccines, for the medical centers, for health centers, for um, all kinds of things. And, and this is really important. This is a big thing that we have realized that it, we, we should give priority to these people because these people also support the, the, the everyday urban uh, economy. And uh, then, of course, we have to, to change our thinking how to provide the, the improvements, the planning improvements, because COVID um, requires different approaches. Yeah, I, what you just said right at the end uh, is so real. I'm, I'm hoping we can come back to that even as we look mm. for practical solutions. Yes, I, I stopped because uh, otherwise I will continue talking. No, but th that's so very true because what COVID has done, Chrissy, like you just said, is mm. that it's compelled us to think through, uh, you know, it's, it's a different world. Our world has been altered is the term that I use. Exactly. And exactly. sometimes I think we grossly underestimate uh, what that really means, but just hold on to that kindly. Yeah, Julian, and, and I started with, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, Julian, I started with you, uh, and uh, if you could wrap up this segment with the same question uh, that I posed to the others, pre-COVID, midst of COVID, post-COVID, uh, when it comes to recovery and the impact on informality. Well, I think my starting premise is that before COVID, African cities were in crisis already. Um, there was the economy has been is driven by the informal economy. It's a low paying economy. Uh, cities themselves, very few cities in Africa, for example, have more than $50 per capita to spend on infrastructure. It's nowhere near enough for anything. But what has really changed is that the capacity of governments, African governments, to borrow money from the international financial institutions, the space is closed. They're, they're, they're indebted to the max. Um, which means where is the money going to come from? And when they can start borrowing again, they're going to have to borrow on the things that COVID really showed, it, uh, showed up, which was the health system, uh, the, the non-investment in the health system and, and various other things. It didn't, no way will government see housing and informal settlements as a priority um, going into the future, which then means that we have to start focusing on our municipalities and their capacity to leverage their own finance so that they're not dependent on these fiscal transfers that come from, from national government. So the whole way we look at how cities are governed, we have to look at and we have to make sure that they have the financial capacities to guarantee cash streams that will enable them to leverage money from their own commercial banks, uh, because there's no other way in which money will be sufficient for the basic infrastructure that we required uh, going forward. So I think that's the big change, that we have to start looking at how infrastructure is financed in African cities, principally in the past through World Bank or African Development Bank loans. Now going forward, it's going to have to be through municipalities themselves leveraging domestic uh, domestic capital. So I think that's a huge change and it's a huge amount of work to get the cities into that position. But if we don't, there simply won't be the investments that are required. Many thanks, Julian. Um, and again, your last point about the whole concept of financing is such a big piece when we look for solutions as well. Um, friends, in the interest of time, I was planning to ask two more questions, but I'm just going to combine the two questions and try and uh, make sure that we give the audience an opportunity to engage the panel as well, because they'll hold it against me if I don't do that. Um, so what I would like to do is this. 
you know, so much has been said and it kind of builds on my first point around COVID and how COVID has altered this world. But I thought something that Ajay said was so profound, the way he described it, and you've all touched on it. And Ajay, I hope I'm quoting you correctly here. You said cities don't accept some slum dwellers as legitimate citizens. Uh, so that's for me exclusion, you know, uh, at its height, right? And I think we are all we we knew that we knew that we know that, but each of you also kind of reflected on possible solutions, looking at the policy discourse. Like, what is what can we do through policy, even as we look at some of the systemic issues? So I'll give you one example. For us at Habitat for Humanity International, for example, we've been we've had had a laser-like focus, as informed by our theory of change, is to put people at the core. And in, when it comes to putting people at the core, we have to ask some key questions about the housing ecosystem, right? It, we have to ask questions about, you know, the target populations that we're working with. Who is left behind, right? We know who we've included, but who have we excluded that we ought to consider when we address some of the systemic issues? So I'm just going to turn to the panel and I'm going to ask this question, if you could keep it very brief, but when you are answering this question about solutions to inclusion, because we know, like um, Kirsten said, is that inequality and inequity has been amplified, just not due to COVID, but we knew this was always a problem that existed before, right? So even as we are looking for durable solutions, I'm just going to ask the so policy, the policy discourse is one avenue, what about partnerships? I kind of just alluded to the fact that for Habitat for Humanity, when we look at the housing ecosystem, we know we can't do this on our own. We need you, each of you, right? So, but we also need others. We need to work with governments like each of you have said. Julian, you, you said it so beautifully about partnerships with government and ownership that government needs to have. So I'm just going to turn to you and, um, Kastron, if I could start with you, and ask this question, what does inclusion really mean? Uh, and if you could kindly keep it brief, uh, so that after this, we are just gonna segue to the audience. So Kirsten, I'll start with you, looking at inclusion versus exclusion, but also solutions in terms of how we can address this issue, both through policy discourse, but also through partnerships. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's uh, um, inclusion really means to look at the, I mean, so following the formulation now from Agile to look at the city as a whole with all its inhabitants and also looking at how everyone can connect to the opportunities of urbanization and transformation in an equal way. So inclusion is not enough to Let's say we always say this slum uh, dwellers or informal settlements are not yet on the map. It's not enough to just have them recognize. We even need to go a step further to say what are the steps that we need to provide in order for people to um, contribute and also be served by the city in an equal manner. Um, so um, that for me is inclusion and then looking at that we can only, I mean, the recognition that we can only do that, so that's a process level now, when we work closely with everyone in the city. So there's both dimension, the what and the how, and uh, and well, and then um, the linking around that, which then also comes, I, I really thought uh, um, this is, our contribution was very strong when she was speaking about the crises, about the systematic planning and the framework also of their recovery planning. And I think that's that's it. I mean, it's about jointly having targets and the planning framework. So we can have them at global level, we can have them at national level, we can have them at city, neighborhood level. But um, And they should talk to each other. But really about having a, a clear, agreed vision and also accountability frameworks and then plug into those the right partners to achieve them and and make sure that all the key stakeholders, which are governments of the society, to keep it simple, are fully on board. And so you were talking about the ownership. And I think it needs to be more than just the government. It needs to be also the civil society and um, and it's also communication between the formal and informal civil society. And 
just uh, um, to finish up, so then also to look at the different dimensions around it. And one key point I think here is also the finance, since we talked about it. We need, since we rethink the way we deliver and we have equity as a target, we also need to look at finance instruments that give us the flexibility to to serve, um, let's say, those entry points and empower the different actors to come in, um, if that is now, um, as we often say, the yeah, people, community-led uh, initiatives, there needs to be particularly there also finance instruments that are supportive, but also local authority, the decentralization of funds and accountability against funds uh, for municipalities and then, um, yeah, the overall support of all the stakeholders that are needed for the transformative process. So thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, Chrissy, um, if you were given a magic wand and said, Chrissy, this is this one thing that would define success to implement the plan that you alluded to, what would that be? Just the one thing that you need as a critical success factor. Yes, uh, for me, in inclusivity in land administration is uh, really important. And in, for my region, I see that this is doable. And um, therefore, uh, for years and years, I fight for um, um, providing property titles to people that they have uh, built, uh, they have invested all their labor in uh, income in, in these informal constructions, because that way we give them access to credit, access to mechanisms, funding mechanisms and all that. We empower them against evictions, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I have given a big struggle for that. So inclusivity in land administration is really important. Then, of course, it is in education. It is building, building professionals, uh, education, professional education. It is really important and professional ethics, and developing the partnerships, as you said, with uh, with uh, the communities, with the private sector. Private sector is really important. And mo most, most, in most cases, the private sector is interested only to provide expensive uh, real estate for the rich people. So we have to build the, uh, the education and the ethics uh, within the professional, the local professional sector. Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, Julian, you talked about financing and co-financing as, as, as a critical success factor. Uh, let's talk about it in the context of what, we, what we're covering right now when it comes to inclusion. Uh, again, if you were given that magic wand, uh, and Chrissy kind of alluded to the role of the private sector, based on your experience, but also in terms of if you were given that wish, what would that really look like? Hmm. I think, sorry, I, I think that when you talk about inclusion, you really have to start going to the root cause of exclusion. And in the context of Africa, Africa is 2.5% of world trade, but 20% of the world's population. Uh, and what you're seeing in African cities is a symptom of their fundamental injustice. Um, and so the very part of first part of inclusion is greater inclusion in the global economy. And from there, many other benefits uh, would flow. Um, so to me, the question about inclusion, I'll get to what my wish would be. The th thing about inclusion is that the agenda of the inclusive city has not been won. There is an alternative agenda, and that is what they call the world-class city, the global city, the competitive city, the city that has to be ready for foreign direct investment, and the poor have to be seen to be invisible because somehow if you see the poor, it's unattractive for foreign direct investment uh, to come into the city. Um, and so my, my, my first wish is just to, is for all mayors and for all presidents of countries to recognize that cities are the spaces where the economy does not depend only on foreign direct investment. It's the agglomeration of all the people together that creates the dynamic of trade and the innovation that upon which uh, cities then grow. And my wish would be that every city uh, develops its own endogenous factors and grows its own economy based on the understanding that cities are the engines of economic growth. Thank you. Thank you. That's so very profound. Thanks, Julian. Ajay, you got us started with that profound statement that you made and a fact uh, that was uh, actually reflected. If you could maybe wrap up this segment with the same question that I asked the other panelists, it's not so much even the wish list, but for 
just really looking at what does like if you take Asia as a region, for example, Julian reflected on Africa and we've looked at other regions as well. But if you take Asia, but it's not, you know, just confined to Asia. What would the game changer really look like for us when it comes to inclusion? Well, I started by raising the issue of legitimacy of the slum dwellers. Let me also uh, on my part wind up this discussion by touching on this issue. What would it take to what would be the game? What could be the game changer? What would result in more inclusive societies? What COVID has aptly demonstrated is that we cannot continue to have islands of prosperity in the sea of poverty. The better offs are no longer insulated from the morbidities or the infection level. They are protected only if the entire city uh, is protected or their well-being is dependent on the citywide well-being as well. How do we legitimize the slum dollar? The policy maker, uh, you know, the decision is at the demand for has only come from the slum dollar. Why can't it be a citywide demand if the well being of the city depends on the well being of the slum dwellers? Then it's an issue of city improved, issue of slum upgrading. I think that's the kind of change in narrative that is required. Rather than continuing to focus narrowly on slum upgrading, the issue that needs to be promoted now, the advocacy that needs to be promoted should be around sustainable development of the cities. And that pressure has to be created by the citizens at large rather than leaving it to the slum dwellers to fight their own battle. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ajay. Uh, so much to reflect on. Um, I'm Friends, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, you inspired me uh, in terms of both your presentation, but also the thinking that's gone, you know, gone into how you are really looking for again durable solutions. Uh, we are not talking about something at a very abstract level. These challenges are real. We need to deal with them, uh, and I think it's absolutely, you know, paramount that you know, even as we come together. And I like the way Kirsten actually kept emphasizing partnerships is that you know without partnerships we are not going to co-create some of these solutions we'll be just focused as you know our respective agencies will be just focused on the problems and the challenges so i really appreciate uh, all what you've done and all what you continue to do but also what you share i have some questions uh, uh, from the audience and i'm i'm unfortunately in the interest of time i can't do a round robin but i might ask one or two of you to respond uh, it's a question from Besam, and his question is, is fiscal decentralization an advocacy strategy to get enough resources at a city level uh, to address these challenges? Uh, Julian, could you talk so much about this and you continue to, to, to advocate for this? Can I turn to you? Yes, yes, you can. Um, I think that in, in the context of Africa, Decentralization is not enough. There is a, a great deal of decentralization in terms of the mandate, but very little fiscal capacity to raise the money to meet the mandates. So what happens is, is that the, the authority is, is, is shifted across to someone else, but not the capacities uh, to implement it. So absolutely, uh, there has to be a, the decentralization and the transfer of, of mandates to the local level, but at the same time, the local level needs to have the capacities to receive and expend money in a transparent way and to have enough stability in their cash flows to enable them to, then to leverage money from, as I said, the commercial banks, etc. So absolutely, fiscal decentralization should be an advocacy strategy. Uh, but it's not enough to give the powers. You really have to develop the capacities uh, to make sure that those powers can be utilized effectively. 
It's a good point. Thank you, Julian. There's a comment here, and I, I'm going to read out the comment. And uh, Kirsten, I might invite you to actually, you don't have to even directly respond, but maybe even reflect on what's being said here. Uh, so the comment is careful about uncritically focusing only on uh, only full on full titles in developing countries. This has not led to improved security of tenure. Please have a look at UN Habitat lecture by Jeffrey Payne. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's in line um, with uh, the former message that we need uh, flexible approaches. I mean, very often when we think about the traditional approaches that apply in formal settings, we might not achieve the right thing. I think we also need to be yeah, um, reminded of different contexts and different uh, situations. Also, yeah, many even within settlements, we have different situations and countries. But yeah, we are um, advocating for the continuum of land rights, where we look at different um, opportunities of uh, tenure security, let's put it that way, from uh, agreements to also community-based solutions. And um, yes, and we have seen that um, just giving the land title ha can have negative uh, impacts in the sense of gentrification. And um, yeah, and also just uh, uh, postponing the challenge to later, let's say, by um, having yeah quite an impact also on the land market. So yes, um, that is a very important comment, and uh, we do advocate for a flexible approach to that, and also um, for a strategic uh, approach to that. I mean, it's an important dimension, land management, as we already heard, to uh, long term also what we agreed on transformation. Thank you. Thanks. Chrissy, would you like to build on uh, anything that Kirsten uh, touched on? Yes, I fully agree that just providing the illegal documents is not enough. Land administration is a whole uh, bunch of, um, of activities that you need to improve in order to have uh, more sustainability in the system. Um, that's why I said in my region I see that it is doable because there is a lot uh, that has been done through the years to improve the systems, to improve uh, stability and um, uh, resilience. Uh, but uh, of course, as, uh, as, as it was already said by Kristen, uh, we talk in FIG, in the International Federation of Surveyors, about the continuum of land rights and everything. And uh, I see that gradually we're going through. The, the situation is not remaining the same. People re recognize the value of, um, of uh, legal titles and uh, the value of access uh, to ownership rights and all that. Um, in, in many cases, people say we don't need any more blankets or um, bringing us food for free. We need you to empower us a little bit with our lands. So whatever concept we find, for them either to be a community uh, titling or um, individual titling or whatever and to, to build uh, awareness to build resilience to, to build to to improve capacity building for them about the value of what uh, they will be given and then we can we can process we can proceed with uh, land titling i think it is important for for having access to any kind of uh, funding mechanisms that, that's 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 a fair comment. Uh, I've been made aware that I probably have about four minutes to wrap this up, but uh, this is how I was planning that we could wrap up. Uh, Ajay, I'm just going to put you on a spot here, and I'm just going to ask you to inspire us because when we see challenges around us, it's pretty daunting, isn't it? I mean, like we talked in the pre-COVID world, we already knew the problem existed. COVID has amplified, and India in many ways was at the forefront, not the only country, but it was also an epicenter of sorts in the midst of COVID. Inspire us maybe even with a, a very short narrative around what's worked. It could be pre-COVID, but in the midst of COVID, and as to how it can inspire us as far as the future is concerned. <laughs> I always love to be in a spot, uh, but responding to your question, well, 
if you want me to narrate an example as to how problem could be turned into an opportunity, let me give you an example of one of the lagging states from India. That's the state of Odisha on the east, which falls in the eastern part of the country. Uh, Pre-COVID, the chief minister of Odisha had planned a statewide slum upgrading program. And they thought assigning legal land titles would be the end of the problem. And they were in the process of doing that. COVID happened and reverse migration happened. A lot of people, a lot of informal workers from the mega cities moved to the smaller towns and rural settlements in Odisha as well. That stressed the state government because they had to provide for this uh, population segment moving back. But they turned it into an opportunity. They started a program which is more like a beach employment guarantee program for cities, right? Whereby the labor force is engaged in public works, but they did not, they remembered that they had this sum upgrading program as well, connected it to improve services in the slum settlements. So on one, one hand, legal titles were provided. On the other hand, service improvement in the informal settlements is happening now. Now, that to me is a good example of turning a challenge into an opportunity. Uh, and this is against the general tide in the country whereby the, uh, the state governments from other provinces have started a slum upgrading program and stopped partially by just assigning legal titles to the slum dwellers. I hope that's inspiring enough. It's definitely inspiring, Ajin. There are the other pieces. It actually, uh, you know, gives us hope, right? Uh, because we don't want to be just overwhelmed with the challenges. We really are looking for durable solutions. And I think what each of you have shared is so very profound in that sense. Is even as we recognize the problems, we are, and and as we seek solutions, that there are possibilities, and that's how you wrapped up. So can I just take this opportunity to thank each of you on behalf of Habitat for Humanity International, Julian. Chrissy, Kirsten, and Ajay, a huge thank you. And thank you for all what you continue to do to make a difference. Over to you, Dean. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you, Patrick, and all of our speakers, Julian, Kirsten, Ajay, and Chrissy, for some brilliant thoughts and observations on how COVID has highlighted the common vulnerabilities of formal and informal settlement dwellers, the resilience and ingenuity of informal resettlement residents, the need to build political support and acknowledge the citizen rights of informal settlement residents and provide their rights of service provision. Whether census, whether the idea of a census can uh, help people to claim those rights and whether a long term stop on evictions would incentivize residents to strike partnerships and also invest in their own communities. And finally, a story of hope in Orissa, where the government used the return of its migrants to cities in the pandemic to engage them in slum uh, and informal settlement upgradation. Terrific discussion and thank you to you all. We're now going into the first of our breakout sessions, five parallel discussions, defeating homelessness and housing exclusion in Europe, the future of how human health, how climate change and the built environment are impacting well-being, policy dilemmas concerning informal Roma settlements, regeneration or desegregation, financing affordable housing in Europe, the way forward, and advancing entrepreneurial shelter solutions. They're yours to choose from, but please remember at the end of those sessions, you must click to join our final round table of the day. I'll see you all back here at 5 p.m. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your breakout sessions and that you're ready for our final session of the day. It's a roundtable discussion in formality and housing, how to improve housing affordability, adequacy and resiliency to meet the needs of low income households. And our moderator for the session is Chris Herrink, Habitat for Humanity International's Vice President for Programme Effectiveness. Chris. Well, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. And welcome to this roundtable session on informality and housing. <coughs> this is part of the European Housing Forum, which is taking place this week in Brussels, Warsaw, and of course, virtually. The Housing Forum is a time when the private sector, governments, and civil society can really come together to share, learn, and advocate for development in the housing sector. As Dean mentioned, my name is Chris Herrink, and I have the privilege of serving as the moderator of this panel. I work for Habitat for Humanity as the Vice President for Program Effectiveness, leading the development of our program strategy, the building of technical expertise, and the measurement of results. I'm really thrilled to have this amazing panel of experts to share with you their experience, their experiences on improving affordability, adequacy, and, resi and resilience in informal settlements. I'd like to just ask each of them to briefly describe to you their position, and then we can move on uh, with the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Joe Maturi. I'm the coordinator of the largest slum dwellers movement uh, in Nairobi. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a land and housing rights activist. I'm also currently the chair of Shark Dwellers International Global. Hi, everyone. My name is Kasia Rust. I'm the executive director of the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa. And we're a think tank that promotes investment in affordable housing, investment whether that's by the private sector or by the public sector or by households themselves. Um, we do that by undertaking research and collecting data and then sharing that widely and creating opportunities for networking um, and really talking about, about what the opportunity is for investment in affordable housing in Africa. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's a big honor to be here with you today. So my name is Anna Claudia Rosba. I'm the regional manager for the region Latin America and Caribbean. I work for Cities Alliance. I'm also the head of the program, the global program on informality. We have been supporting um, technical assistance on demand, facilitating exchanges of knowledge and practice around uh, the region and, and globally. Uh, our core core uh, area of action is um, cities and in cities urban poverty and informality. And greetings, everybody. My name is Stephen Seidel. I'm the senior director for technical partnerships at Habitat for Humanity International. I've also had the great pleasure and privilege of being part of the organizing team that has pulled together uh, the Europe Housing Forum. So I'm very grateful to uh, our panel for being part of this session today and for all of the presenters and all of you for joining us uh, during this, um, what I think is already uh, proving to be a remarkable uh, gathering. So back to you, Chris. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here and I'm looking forward to this conversation. To begin with, I thought it might be helpful to start with a basic definition. Informal settlements can be defined by being geographically, economically, socially, and politically disengaged from wider urban systems and excluded from opportunities and decision-making. Living in informal settlements disproportionately affects certain groups. Informal settlements often sit on the periphery of urban areas, lacking access to markets and resources. Sustainable Development Target 11.1 .1 actually measures access to adequate housing and upgrading of slums. And it's one of the SDG targets that is actually regressing or going backwards. The absolute number of people living in informal settlements has continued to increase. And by 2018, it exceeded 1 billion people. 
Projections for 2030 estimate a further increase in the number of people living in informal settlements to 1.2 billion, with the largest proportional increase occurring in Africa. And with that, I'd like to start with you, Joseph, and then proceed. Um, how do you see informality contributing to unaffordable and inadequate housing? What is that relationship from your experience in terms of informality as a contributing factor and a defining factor in terms of unaffordable and inadequate housing? Uh, thank you very much, Chris. And probably I'll pick uh, this from the earlier conversation that had started on email. Uh, and I think uh, I, I tend to agree with Anna Claudia. Number one, I think um, it doesn't contribute to, it does or uh, it, 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 it's a double-edged uh, sword. Number one, if you look at um, because of the lack of proper planning, because of lack of urbanization, everybody, everything being centered uh, in the capital being centralized. Uh, people come to the city either to look for jobs or the good schools or the factories are centralized. So, and most of the cities are not prepared uh, for the influx of people coming, even economic migrants. They are not prepared for the people who are coming to work in the city. So people have to devise their own means of providing housing. Uh, people who are well connected to government, people who have money, resources, they are the ones who invest in these sharks. So number one, uh, initially here in Kenya, we used to call them, uh, we, because the land obviously doesn't belong to them, we used to call them um, uh, structure owners because they build structures, very poor, no services, no toilets, no water. But now another term is called informal service providers because they identified a gap uh, the state didn't provide, so they provide in houses. The houses, yes, they are cheap. Um, uh, they are affordable, given that uh, a lot of people who live in the informal settlements, they work on uh, very low incomes. They work in factory laborers. They provide um, security. So that's what they are able to afford. Uh, but then again, uh, given that that service is being provided by the informal service providers, but then again, there's something we are calling, we call the poverty penalty. Uh, we have to look at housing beyond the four walls. We have to look at uh, services. We have to look at um, uh, public spaces. We have to look at are we connected to the city grid in terms of the sewer? Are we, do we get water? So you'll find that all these services will be provided by somebody else and at a higher charge. So, for example, if you look at the work we are currently doing in the city of Nairobi, uh, when I talked about the poverty penalties, we'll find that um, poor people in these informal settlements, in terms of services, water, they pay 150% higher than people living in informal, set informal settlements. When it comes to electricity, poor. When it comes to the sewer connection, they have to devise their own ways. You have heard about flying toilets. You have heard about... Um, uh, so there's that poverty penalty. So there's a connection. Yes, uh, informality. Uh, people identify gaps, it provides for housing. But then again, it's poor housing. Uh, and the other thing about also to talk about even the city itself, and I talked about earlier about the city not being prepared by the people who are coming to the cities, uh, is also in terms of priority. Most of our cities, most of our national governments, some this I'm speaking on the context of Africa, when it comes to housing, uh, in the pecking order of priorities, and this is something that you mentioned, uh, Political decisions, are, when political decisions are made, bad decisions are made, they tend to invest on already formal spaces. That's where they provide house. That's where they provide services. Uh, this is where they improve housing. But when it comes to informal settlements, uh, because there's, it's somehow invisible. Because if you look at most of the informal settlements, and I'm talking in the context of Africa, they are either on riparian land. They are area. They are in areas that's not designated for, and most of the lands either are private or they are public. So they don't get the services. So when it comes to the pecking order of priorities at the city level, you will find that housing uh, will appear on the bottom of the list. In fact, one of the jokes we usually, we realize that um, in Kenya, the political dispensation is that we have governors as the head of um, a county. So we realize in our county, even the budget for the governor's office for snacks is higher than the actual, is higher than the budget for housing mm, for the city. So in terms of priority, 
poor governance. That again, we have to, to give it poor decision making. So the other thing, uh, most government and cities depend on the national census, which mostly happens after 10 years. So this uh, enumeration, this data is not usually accurate. So that leads to underfunding. Uh, that leads, so we have been comparing uh, within the SDF fraternity, the kind of data that is collected by Islam dwellers uh, federations across Africa. And you compare it to the national data, it's usually off the mark by very far. So when it comes to services, when it comes to prioritizing, so the other thing you have to understand is that um, uh, so, some of the excuses that the cities use, we cannot put services, we can provide not providing house here. So if you go to the UN Habitat, all these global forums, I don't know, some governments, I don't know what is the magic number with 10,000. Every government uh, promises 10,000 housing this year. Another one are very ambitious, they'll provide, they'll promise 100,000. But we are not seeing these houses, the demand is increasing. Eh? So the other thing, the market, if you leave it to the market, most of these people, the, the people who are providing houses in the market, either developers, for them it's about the bottom line, it's about profits. Uh, they don't think it's, uh, it, it's, it's fancy enough of slums are investable. They don't think uh, putting uh, their money in, in, in slums, they want to invest in middle income, high income housing, where they'll go quickly build, make a killing and move out. So nobody wants to invest. And government is not giving housing, especially in informal settlements where housing is needed. I'll give the context of my city of Nairobi. We have around give and take 4 million people. Uh, almost uh, three quarters live in informal settlements. Yeah, but these areas are not being provided. We usually have a joke, whether we like it or not, everybody in Nairobi has a relative in the slums. But we, 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 we don't give it the attention that it needs. And I think it's... So for me, the issue of um, whether it contributes and or it doesn't contribute, yes, we get housing, but it's poor, it's not adequate, lack of services. Uh, if you look at uh, the amount of, of money they pay for a 10 by 10 shack, uh, but that's what they are affordable. There is um, an exploitation of poor people when it comes to housing. Thank you. I don't know if I have exhausted my five minutes. Uh, no, you've done very well. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah. And, and you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I, I like how you um, framed it in terms of a, a poverty penalty and how you brought out a lot of different interrelated aspects, including poor governance, uh, including uh, economic systems that are uh, not functioning well. Um, and also, I, I really like what you talked about in terms of uh, invisibility and how um, even just basic data uh, is lacking. Um, and so maybe we can come back to that uh, at, at a future point in the conversation. But I'd like to explore ways in terms of what you see in terms of being able to increase that uh, invisibility and, and strategies uh, to do so. So thank you so much. Um, how about you, uh, Casey? How, how do you see it um, from, from where you sit? Thank you. You know, it was, was it maybe 20 years ago or so? Some of you might remember with me that um, UN Habitat published a report on, on housing finance. Um, and, and, and within that report, it, it talked about adequate housing that was unaffordable and affordable housing that was inadequate. And, and I, I, that framed so much of my thinking and of CAF's thinking as, as we grew and we developed and we thought about this dichotomy. But if you add climate into that and, and think about the current pressures that we're facing now, and if you think about your capex, your capital investment costs versus your operating costs over the long term, in fact, we could say that inadequate housing is also not affordable either. Um, and because of even if households are able to access housing informally by quickly putting something up, that inadequacy is expensive, as, as Joe said. Um, and, and that costs much more over the long term. Um, it costs much more for the household, it costs much more for the city in terms of the consumption of resources, and then of course for the nation and then our planet. Um, so it, it really is a critical issue to think about and to think about how and why. Um, 
it's something that we've thought about this year. You know, we publish, CAF publishes every year a yearbook, which I'm just going to quickly hold up because we just launched it last week or two weeks ago. So this is the 2021 edition. It's our 12th edition. And we document the housing situation in all 54 countries um, and the Western Sahara across across Africa. Um, and this year, what we asked is for all the authors to speak specifically to informality and what were the issues of informality that were being faced. Um, one of the things that that I like to look at, and, and Chris, you mentioned the, the um, SDG target 11.1. And if we think about the definition of slums, I, I think it's important that we tease out that definition. Um, and that's sort of what comes out in, 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 the, in what the yearbook authors have been writing in their particular countries. So there's five components of informality in terms of that definition. And the first one is, of course, durable housing. And that's the first one we think about because we think about an informal settlement and we think about shoddy housing. Um, the second one is sufficient living space. So issues of overcrowding. Um, and we think about how many people are living in a house, particularly significant an issue in COVID times um, when it becomes quite difficult to, to isolate. Um, then thirdly, access to services, safe water. Um, and then fourthly, sanitation. And then lastly, tenure. Those five things together, the definition of, of informal, when we look at it in terms of the SDGs, any one of those. So there are some situations where if we tease out the definition, there is something that's solvable, much more quickly solvable. So when we looked at, and we were using um, data that's collected by USAID, the Demographic Health Survey data, which I think is a really interesting data set. And, and Joe, I think would support also some of the, the work that you're doing, the DHS data set. We've put it together in a dashboard on our website that's exploring the, the bottom 40th percentile and their housing circumstances. And when we look just at the bottom 40th percentile in Nigeria, for example, um, living in urban areas, there's 7 million people in the bottom 40th percentile living in urban areas in Nigeria. And of those, 93% are living in inadequate housing. 93% of the bottom 40th percentile. But if we tease that apart, 35% are living in informal structures where the building materials are not formal, only 35%. Then another 52% do not have adequate sanitation services. And then another 5% are overcrowded. So there's an opportunity to start to tease it apart. And I think we have to do that because that fundamentally impacts on the cost of resolving it which impacts on, on the affordability of them. Um, another point to consider in this, all of this, I think is, and something, Joe, that you mentioned is, is I would argue that informality is something that is forced as a result of barriers to entry. Um, that informality is something that arises because it's very difficult to be formal. So, it could be from, from the demand side that a household is unable to afford a formal dwelling that's approved, and so they build a haphazard dwelling of one kind of, and then that gets cold informal, and they're forced into that situation because of their informality. Um, but also from, a, from the supply side, and I think there is a really important area to look at, because the cost of registering a business and formalizing a business, of, of, of building not just the registration costs, but also just pulling together all the things that make you a functioning business, um, the accounting and the bookkeeping procedures and all of those things. Um, the, the rigid financial systems that we have that don't recognize small scale providers, um, that don't recognize on, on the demand side households who earn their incomes differently than a standard pay slip. Um, and so access to financial services is severely limited, and that then reduces the amount of capital that somebody has to actually invest in construction or purchase of, of a house. Um, the inefficient or inaccessible statutory processes, and we were looking at that a lot in South Africa right now around title deeds, and just how difficult it is to access a title deed and enable a transaction process to happen, especially if you're a low-income person and you're in a segment of the economy where you don't readily access a conveyancer or a lawyer or whatever, or the millions of documents you need to produce and they have to be in a hard copy and, and so on. 
Um, and then also very critically broken value chains that don't connect to one another. So all the steps from land identification and assembly and titling and infrastructure and construction and, and ongoing maintenance and so on, and that those links in the chain are broken. Um, and so what ends up happening is that low income people literally have to make a plan. And within that context, they make a plan that overrides the errors that there's great capacity in that. And I think there's a real there's something that we need to grab onto and engage with. And I think the work again that that Joe and 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 SDI across the world is doing is really important in recognizing that. And just to conclude with like some of the basic facts that we have to hold in our heads, whether we're policymakers or whether we're lenders or DFIs, is that the informal sector is the largest employer across Africa and probably many other places too. Um, it, it employs more people. Um, it may, those same people may also be working formally, so there may be some people that are doubling, um, but definitely the informal sector is a significant employer and a lot of money is coming in that way and our financial systems don't know how to respond to that. And so the systems we develop to support good housing processes are inaccessible to that market. Um, and possibly as a result of that, but also other things, most housing across this continent, across Africa, um, is built one by one by, by households themselves or by micro builders and small builders. We just did some work in Rwanda where we segmented the supply side. And, and the large scale developers are like 6% of delivery on the very, very, and everything else is done by these small scale providers that neither the policy nor the financial system actually recognize. Um, and so that's bound to be an informal process and it's bound to be an inefficient process because it's not supported with capital. Um, and then of course the last basic fact is urbanization rates are, are so significant. Um, that, as Joe said, the city just can't cope. And and so there has to be some way in which, I mean, getting to your next question, how do we enable the informal and recognize, don't, don't take that as a pejorative term, enable it and recognize it as this vibrant opportunity to actually solve the problem. I'll stop there. Wow, that's incredibly uh, rich. Uh... Um, experience that you've brought and uh, I, I like how you've drawn from the the report that that you recently uh, did and I would just amplify one point um, Habitat actually also recently um, uh, did some research trying to link employment and housing and as it turns out between four and eleven percent of um, all uh, workers in a particular country are linked to construction and then, as you talked about, there's the informality aspect. When we say workers, there's a whole range. So in a country like South Africa, I believe it's 50%, but in a country like India, it's, it's well over 90% in terms of the informality. So construction is a huge portion of the number of workers, the absolute number of workers, and then those workers being uh, in, informal as well. Um, but I love uh, how you started in terms of talking about uh, inadequate housing as not being um, as being unaffordable as well. Certainly, uh, when we bring in the climate um, uh, dimension to it and, and unsustainable, um, I liked how you talked about the different uh, those five different dimensions, each of which is necessary but but not sufficient, and and the need to break each of those down. Um, I also thought it was really interesting uh, how you talked about how actually formality is is costly. It's a costly thing uh, to become formalized, and it's also very uh, complex as well. So um, thank you very much, and uh, we'll just hand it over to uh, Anna Claudia for, for your thoughts. Thanks again. Thank you, Chris. Amazing to talk and interact with Joe and Kasia, uh, two people that I admire a lot professionally and personally. Uh, I tend to agree with most uh, of, of the narrative. So maybe I can share a little bit from, from the perspective here in Latin America. And I, as Joe mentioned before, I understand informality has been the major opportunity 
for many migrants, uh, rural, urban, uh, from different cities, from different countries, you know, to settle down in cities. So uh, if you look at our urbanization process in Latin America since the 60s, uh, we have been mostly informally urbanized. And the major bulk of housing production has been actually built by the people. So we call it social production of, of the habitat. Actually, we have globally, I would say, three types of housing production, right? We have the houses produced by the private sector, and there you have the different ranges of private sector. You have big companies, you have smaller entrepreneurs, uh, 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 diverse uh, diversity in terms of private companies. Uh, you have the public sector, um, but usually also engaging lately the private sector to build houses. Uh, some of those houses are built informally. Uh, we see here in Latin America many housing projects, and I'm sure in Africa, in the Philippines, I saw that as well. Uh, I'm sure in other countries from the Global South, uh, buildings that were uh, housing projects that were built and provided by the government that were never formalized. So the, the, the public policies, they have been supporting informality in housing too. And then you have the social production, which is actually uh, the major bulk of production. And we really, as Joe said, need to give attention to this sector, um, also from the environmental perspective, right? I tend to disagree a little bit, Kestia, when you say that um, it is costly for the environment, because I don't know, we don't have the numbers, but if I think about the impact of the formal housing construction versus the impact of the informal housing construction until now, I would rather say that the formal housing construction had far more impact on the environment than the informal. Uh, especially if you talk about, I understand the pressure on environment, on river banks and environmentally protected areas, but if you think about the housing materials, um, because um, many people build, uh, yeah, wood, bamboo, you know, the local materials, whereas the formal construction used uh, concrete and steel. I participated at a COP session last week organized by the German government, and uh, there was a projection if we keep building with concrete and steel, we'll just not be able to, to, to meet the targets that we have. So we need to change the patterns. And I believe the impact of the poor, the, the, the footprints of the poor, they have been smaller um, than uh, of the formal sector. But I do believe that they represent an opportunity now because we already have an informal built environment and we need to maximize this built environment. We cannot afford to uh, let our cities grow, you know, on a sprawled ma uh, manner like we are doing right now in the global south through public policies because housing projects they have been produced in the peripheric areas of the cities or informally uh, by the people or even the markets so uh, i agree with the city planning perspective we need to work on that right uh, work on densification and maximize um, this these buildings that were built by the people we need to improve the quality and uh, not only of these buildings but also uh, of the overall uh, neighborhood and in agreement that we don't have information so the work that you are doing KCI, the work that SCI is doing is contributing a lot for us to understand the environment right um, to attract invi investments from the private sector but also uh, from the people if they understand the security of tenure if there is you know perspectives improving uh, the quality of life of the whole neighborhood uh, private investments from people can could could also be leveraged and also public um, investments uh, from cities I understand um, that cities, uh, many cities still don't accept informality. We are working together right in South Africa. Uh, we see in India, uh, so many informal areas were not, are still not on the maps. They are still not uh, considered in terms of planning. Um, so in this aspect, I believe the lessons from Latin America, Chris, again, is that I believe we learn how to tolerate informality here. We understood, right, that this is part of our reality. 
uh, we learn how to tolerate and we evolved in some cities and in some countries in terms of creating, you know, uh, formal structures, formal frameworks that embrace and embed informality. For me, the battle against informality is lost. Informality won. And, and there is no chance for us. So we need to find a way where the frameworks can embrace what we have. So I stop here for now. That's interesting. Thank you, Anna Claudia. And you know, in uh, in terms of climate change, you know, there's a difference between mitigation and adaptation. And what I hear you saying is that in terms of informal settlements, uh, a strategy and one of the lessons from Latin America is adaptation, right? It's it's trying to maximize and make more efficient and more effective um, the current informal settlements uh, that are a reality and that exist and use that as the starting point. Um, but thank you very much. Really appreciate that. So uh, to our last uh, panelist, Stephen, over to you. Well, thank you, Chris. And um, I'm in the highly coveted position of following three brilliant and um, uh, esteemed colleagues and, and passionate presentations. So um, we're also kind of at the end of, nearing the end of our day, uh, and hopefully a number of you who are uh, tuning in have participated or listened in to a number of the sessions, a number of the sessions have um, uh, explored in other ways the phenomenon and the reality of informality um, across our housing systems. And I want to reflect on one that is, I think, very compatible uh, with our conversation so far in the comments from Casia and Anna and, uh, and Joe. Uh, it was Anna's colleague, Julian Baskin, in a previous session. Um, and Casia, you, you kind of echoed this theme in your comments that um, informality is a signal, is an indication of the resilience of the poor, that uh, the, the, the creation, the instigation of informal places in which to live are a reflection of decisions that the poor have made to better their lives, to come to, a, to an urban area, to, to come for employment, better schools, better opportunities for their, for their families. And despite the obstacles, despite the challenges of, of, uh, of a lack of housing and lack of systems to support that housing, they are making their way um, and uh, as Anna Claudia just said, um, the battle uh, with informality is over and informality has won. It is, a, it is an unavoidable uh, reality. So, so then the question is kind of now what? You know, what do we do in, in light of this fact of, of our lives where you know, more than a billion people um, live and growing numbers are, are uh, experiencing every day? I just comment on two things just to um, uh, kind of reflect some of the thoughts that uh, that we have at, at Habitat for Humanity. Uh, one is, and I want to kind of chime in on the five housing quality standards that, uh, Casey, you you mentioned the durability, housing, the 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 in month space, water, sanitation, and secure tenure. And if you break those those five elements down, um, the the ability for households to create an adequate living space for themselves is often a kind of an incremental journey that is often kind of self-achieved, you know, with their own resources over time, with the uh, potentially with, you know, local tradespeople and and uh, and so forth, building a core house or a core, core structure that is added onto and so forth. But when you get to um, the, the systems of water, sanitation and secure tenure, that's a more complex um, process to achieve. And so, um, so I, I do agree with the strategy of kind of breaking those elements down and having distinct strategies for how do you address things like water and sanitation and other basic services um, and the potential for achieving those or achieving adequacy in those areas is oftentimes a collective process. It is hard to for a single family to get adequate water and sanitation, especially in an urban environment. It has to be a kind of a collective um, effort. So I think that's one, one intriguing area, I think, to, to, uh, to really dive into. 
And the second, coming to the the question of uh, in the environmental uh, issues, um, um, I, I think I think the question about the impact um, of informal settlements on the environment, I would tend to side, and I think the data tilts a little bit towards Anna Claudia's perspective that that there's relatively modest impact of the poor and informal settlements on broader greenhouse gas emissions and, and environmental impacts, but the impact of the environment on the poor and the vulnerability uh, that they are in for as a result of, of finding homes or finding land that they can settle in that is vulnerable to disasters, to flooding, to landslides, to earthquakes, to um, you know, to other environmental hazards is a very urgent problem. And it's becoming more urgent as climate change intensifies and as more and more people um, gravitate towards uh, towards urban centers. So um, I think there's there's a lot of agreement among among us. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to be um, uh, kind of reflecting a little bit on the conversations, not just from uh, all of you, but from the previous conversations that have taken place during um, our uh, our sessions here today. So, Chris, back over to you. Great, thank you, Stephen, and thanks for um, you know really pinning it uh, in terms of the resilience uh, of the poor and therefore the the deserving of respect by government and by the private sector and by civil society. Uh, and I like as well. Um, how you talked about it being both an individual journey. Every person living uh, in an informal settlement does have an individual story, but also some of these um, issues, some of the five dimensions require a, a collective uh, organization in order to um, address. And, and that's just a wonderful segue um, into kind of what uh, I'd like to talk about next and, and give each of you a chance to talk about uh, promising practices. So if we've sort of have a sense of how informality is framed and some of the dynamics uh, around informal settlements, um, you know, what kind of things can be done in order to increase visibility, in order to gain respect, in order to improve on what exists currently? And so I'd like to pose that question uh, to each of you, maybe starting with Joe again, what are those promising practices? What are those signs of hope? Um, what are those proofs of, of, you know, concept or ideas uh, that really can have scale, have systemic uh, impact where you have seen uh, in your experience in terms of Im improving housing in, in those informal environments? So over to you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And just before I talk about your second question, is uh, you are talking about the resilience of slum dwellers. And I think uh, where we are at the moment, uh, slum dwellers are saying, don't call us resilience. We don't know what you might call us next. And I think it's upon us, how do we address these issues now? How do we provide adequate, affordable housing now? How do we unlock the land question and the get secure tenure now? Uh, slum dwellers are constantly under the threat of eviction. They dread uh, when is the day the bulldozers are going to come. Uh, so the message is that we don't want to be called resi resilience. We don't know what you might call us next. Let's solve this uh, problem now. So in terms of practice, there are so many community initiatives that are happening across Africa, Asia, and Latin America uh, in the production of housing. Uh, people uh, providing their own with corporate, through cooperatives, through daily savings, through partner, partnering with the governments. Just to mention, one of uh, long term, we are one of the projects and the processes that we work with Cities Alliance, and I think Ana Claudia can attest to this. We are working in some cities and we are looking at the secondary cities. These secondary cities in the future are going to be the Nairobi's, the Lagos, the Rios uh, in 10 years. Come. So, how do you work with the cities to start preparing? Because people, are, the, the immigration won't stop, uh, the economic migrants won't stop. So, how do we? make sure that cities are have planned properly so one of the projects just to speak on the context of where i am uh, we worked with the city of nairobi we moved from uh, uh, 
doing in situ slum upgrading in a few communities as a federation from moving from uh, 100 houses, uh, 50 houses here and there. We at that time people were talking about uh, people were talking about um, scaling up. So we moved from uh, building 100 houses in two years or three years to planning for a settlement of uh, over 100,000 people. You can look at that. It's called the Mukuru Special Planning Area. So we partnered with the city. We mobilized 40 organizations which were providing one level of service in that informal settlements or another. We supported the county to come up with a plan eh, for the informal settlements. Uh, for, for Mukuru, we are talking about um, over 600 acres of land. We are talking about a population of almost half a million. We are talking about a place where the city has not invested even a single cent. So if you're talking about good practices, one of the things I say, the market alone, we cannot leave uh, the provision of housing to the market alone. We have realized even government alone cannot be able to do it. So for us who organize people around cooperatives, we also realizing even our meager savings cannot. But poor people are saying we are willing to meet. We know there's nothing like free lunch, but we are willing to meet you halfway. Yeah? So let's unlock the land question first. Let's address the land question first. If you look in Africa, most of the lands either, and I mentioned before, it's either private land, public. Most of the lands, somebody mentioned about climate change. Now we are facing another eviction uh, through the impacts of climate change. So climate change used to be something very foreign, very European. We are talking about snow melting somewhere, the Amazon forest. But we are realizing that climate change is, even in Africa, climate change is here with us. We are also realizing that effects we are looking at the effects and the work, some of the work we have been involved in the last few years is highlighting the effects of climate change in informal settlements. So most of the informal settlements either are on low-lying grounds at the periphery of the city. So when they are flooding, most of the water upstream end up in the informal settlement, which have got absolutely nothing to do with what's happening in the city. So those are things that we are realizing. So some of this initiative, well, let's look at it from unlocking the land question. Let's look at it from a planning perspective. Uh, let it become not issue of slums and the challenges of slums. Uh, forget about all these big words that uh, are now coming in, adaptation, mitigation. We are still trying to figure out all those, the adaptation, mitigation, resilience, all those. So let's look at it from a perspective. That the challenges of informality is not the slum dwellers problem. They usually say that's their problem. But let's look at it as a city problem. Let's look at it as a policy problem. If you look at the most, most policies uh, are not friendly to informal settlements. They are not friendly in terms of housing, in terms of services. So one of the things that we looked when we are doing the Mokuru special planning area was what policies exist. Number one, if you look at the roads uh, and why we negotiated for Mukuru to be a special uh, planning area, the standards in terms of policy at city level and national level, if you say you follow and conform to the normal standards of housing and providing houses, poor people will be left out of it. We don't conform in terms of the density. If you look at the densities, if you look at uh, service. So let's say, for example, the standards say that uh, for road uh, connectivity to the city, if you do two roads, uh, 30 meter roads or three 30 meter roads in an informal settlement, uh, the entire settlement is gone. You have displaced thousands and thousands of people. If you look at the housing standards, if you look at the materials used, if you look at what does the law say in terms of the sizes of the house, once again, the, informal, the informality will lose out. But we are saying, can we look at what, can we negotiate, we change our politics in a way that it accommodates. So if you look at the density, so for example, you have Mokuru, half a million people, you have 600 acres of land, you are looking at this as a planning, from a planning perspective, whereby you are looking at public spaces, you are looking at areas where markets, and if, if you look at all this, and you say you follow the normal standards, you will end up only housing eh, 50,000 people because those are the standards. But we don't want to displace anybody. But if we look at our policies and say, these policies, policies do not conform to, uh, to informal settlements. How do we look at that? How do we look at, let's look at it from a planning perspective. And that is what we are able to negotiate to reduce the 30 meter roads. 
We are able to look at a very simple community integrated sewer system. We are able to look at how does every household uh, at the plot level get adequate clean water. And this is something now which is being implemented. The plans were adopted by the city. It's being implemented. It's in the implementation stage. So we there are so many case studies. Then again is to look at what are poor communities doing in the areas of housing? How do we take that? Somebody mentioned, how do we support that? How do we amplify that? How do we support whatever initiative at that community level? I've looked at some cases, uh, probably somewhere in Latin America, where the city partners with the informal slum dwellers and say, uh, at least the houses have to be these standards, we are willing, you do this, we will bring in the services. And that is what has been, let us look at that. So the other thing is to look at also the housing finance. Mm -hmm. Uh, the housing finance bit so that's a challenge yeah uh, in terms of um, if you look at the market the market can't provide housing if you look at the government government is struggling if you look at um, the court committees is doing yes they are doing something but not at the scale uh, it's it's low but it's something this is something that we want to amplify so let's look at the findings inside yeah? let us come up with products that are friendly to poor people, let us come up with policies, let us forget about the bottom line, forget about the profits, forget for, forget about, let's, so that's number one. So the other thing is to look at um, the difficulty in using uh, short-term deposits. If you look at the process that community, the mega saving they are doing. So we have done some work on in situ slum upgrading, but for us it was more or less uh, having the rights to the land. So most government interventions when you're addressing issues of slum is no, you can't be here, but you, we are going to take you somewhere 50 kilometers away. So you destroy neighborhoods, you destroy uh, a, a system which has been there, you displace family, you destroy the social fabric. That's why I said initially, let's look at housing beyond just the four walls. So that's usually the government response. We'll take you 50 kilometers away, new land, uh, you find your own money to build. We won't even bring in services. Uh, in my federation, we had this habit of the response was always, if there's a threat of eviction, uh, they used to rush to us. We are being evicted, help give us some money to buy land. We saw we are letting the government off the hook. Why don't we fight for the rights, the rights of the poor to be as the citizens of the city, to participate in the city development? So we stayed put. So we are looking at in situ upgrading, what initiatives are there, uh, what financing models, come up with financing models that um, uh, work for the poor. Let us look at our policies. Some policies are very good. Let's look at the taxation for people who provide uh, low income housing. Mm -hmm. Is there tax rebates? Let's look at the zoning laws. Let's look at um, uh, some areas are designated to be somewhere else, but people settled there. So is there an opportunity to change that zone from industry or probably to housing and people can provide housing? Because all this, if you look at, they are providing, look at the economies of this informal service, they are providing one level of, city, of, of, of service to the city or another. Thank you so much, Joe. I, I love and really appreciate what you talked about in terms of now and urgency and of not defaulting to um, language that uh, people don't understand. So I appreciate that. Um, and I, I also like the powerful example you gave of the uh, Mukulu special planning area. Um, but I'd, I'd like to maybe um, as a point of uh, privilege, just follow up with a quick question. And, and it's really um, kind of um, reflected in, in one of the questions that's coming from uh, uh, one of the observers. Uh, Dean Nelson, which talks about how residents can access their rights and needs when corrupt politics is at work. Um, so maybe uh, taking liberties and, and reframing that, you talked about how the city actually adopted uh, the planning, how the city actually became a, a partner. Um, how did that process work? Because that, that seems to be um, a really important aspect um, of, of the success of, of, of the example that you gave. 
before I go there, just on a later, later note, Kasia, they are trying to kick you out. They have uh, switch off the lights. <laughs> So I think to answer that, it has been years and years uh, of, first of all, you cannot wish away uh, the critical mass, the social investment that we have done in the community mobilization. You cannot wish away the resilience and uh, you cannot wish away the resistance uh, to the evictions that were there. It started by uh, collecting information. Part of our DNA is to equip slum dwellers to collect their own information, map their neighborhoods, map their services, map their populations. That's where we start with information. And this is information that the city doesn't have or doesn't have the capacity to collect. Uh, it's also challenging um, the former in terms of when the city wants to collect information, it's big money involved, corruption involved. Somebody gets these consultants of millions, get three or five university students, walk around, collect information, do a nice, very glossy report. But for us, the information that slum dwellers collected, they make, it's always to make sure that everybody's ownership starts there. Equipped, trained. So with that information on the mapping, communities are able now to start negotiating. We have realized we have one toilet in a population of 200. So where do we start in terms of addressing that? So with the information that we had, we were able to approach the city and tell them this is the situation in Mukuru. And within your bylaws, it says that you have uh, the power to declare a place as a special planning area. And what it means as a special planning area, it means that uh, you don't conform to the normal standards of planning. Yeah? You have to reduce, you have to negotiate with the community, that's what happened. So we pushed after many, many years, they adopted that. And we pushed and we had allies in the city uh, to take Mokuru as a case study. Yes, there are challenges. Number one, uh, there are people who are providing one level of services. Even the people who own these sharks, they are not the ordinary Joe, you and I. These are people well connected. They have invested over 1,000 shark slums. They have thousands and thousands of houses in these informal settlements. So what they do, they collect rent every tax free. Some of them are very well connected individuals. They are known. They put in uh, their enforcers on the ground to collect on their behalf. So we are changing. First of all, is to challenge that is the school. Uh, you are challenging the, 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 the shark, the structure owners. Uh, the people who provide informal informal services, water, sanitation, toilet, electricities. These are people, this is big business. You're also challenging that. And the most important is that we were telling uh, the city, if you look at Mokuru, and if you, if you declare Mokuru a special planning area, these are some of the, you provide water, but you don't get anything from the water that is being provided. Somebody has tapped water illegally. It's going to, so you, you, you had to show the city this is what eh, you are also addressing in terms of. So it took years, so we pushed, we worked. We, we also worked with a number of organizations that were able to provide a service that the city didn't have. We worked with legal organization, legal clinics. They were able to look at the law, interpret the law, and tell the city, actually, you can do this and this. So it was a city plan, but we made sure that it's a plan that's owned by the, 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 the ownership had to be the community. We changed the participation model to make sure that there's a hundred percent participation. So it's it's not something, so it's getting traction. At the moment, we are happy that uh, there are some, the city has come in, they are doing roads, they are providing free water, they are providing the free integrated. The cabinet passed that um, uh, they passed the budget. They will be doing thirteen thousand houses, eh? and the process has already started for the residents of Mokuru. So that's something that we also have to guard, not to be like the other corrupt projects where the intention is for slum dwellers, but the houses end up being uh, middle class houses. So it's a process. It requires a lot of uh, persuasion, a lot of creating alliances not with the, political, with the political class. For us, we recognize that the political class has a sell by date. After five years, they go. Yeah? So how do you make allies with this direct, the director of environment, director of that, the director of that? These are people who will survive any political cycle. That's excellent. Thank you, Joe. Um, the, the process of 
information, education, advocacy over a period of time is, is really effective. So I, I really appreciate that a very powerful example. Um, may I hand it over to you, uh, Kasia? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think, Joe, what you're saying is so right, that data and market transparency, if you show things, if you make everyone see it, it, it really reduces the opportunities for corruption, actually, and, and puts everyone in, in charge of, of the process that's happening. I think the thing that SDI does that is so, so helpful and uh, from, a, from a macro perspective is that SDI is an aggregator. SDI aggregates all of the, the micro interventions made by each individual member, whether they're saving or how they're operating. It puts that together so that there is a group now, a federation that can be engaged with and and that makes the informal in some ways accessible to the governance process. And I say that the governance process in many instances hasn't noticed that, that there's that opportunity that the aggregation is such a useful thing to, to connect around. Um, and, and so I would argue that a lot of what SDI has been doing and, and the examples that, that Joe put forward are, are those are excellent examples for opportunities because they're they're really leveraging the capacities of individuals and putting them together into a, a whole that looks that is big. Um, the other thing that we need is disaggregation. We need to be able to disaggregate capital. Um, and disaggregate activity that's happening at the large scale. And we keep on talking about doing things at scale, and then we imagine these multi tens of thousands. Joe, you said all these 10,000 house plans, um, which don't get finished. Um, even if they sometimes start all 10,000 houses at once, they often don't get higher than, than the window level. So recognizing that what we need to do is figure out a way to disaggregate capital so that it doesn't require a big project, but that it can engage with the way in which supply actually happens in real life, which is in these small projects and small interventions done by small scale players. And, and we've got a real disconnect right now that all of the funds and even even Stephen, I would suggest even the, the, the micro build fund um, really struggled to get its money into the small activity. Um, we need some form of a, a way to disaggregate the big money to recognize the reality of small projects. And in that, I think it's about really embracing all of us and, and the development sector itself has a really important role to play. This notion, what we've been calling massive small. Um, that there is this massive opportunity of small interventions, one plus one plus one plus four, all added up together that create this opportunity. Um, an example, you asked for an example, my favorite example, and I have, I, I say it often, um, so apologies, but I do think it's even relevant in, in a place in, in Europe, in, in many cities in Europe, um, is, is taking a look at leveraging poorly performing land markets. And those are niche, Sometimes, you know, the city is going crazy, fabulous land market, but there's a neighborhood where land markets are undervalued. And, and in South Africa, there's a company called Tough. Um, and what they do is they provide mortgage finance to, how, to small scale landlords to buy and improve rental accommodation. Now that is in, in this city, and that, now it's dark, so I can't show you, but out there, there is a lot of rental housing and a lot of that would classify as informal settlement. So we've got slum buildings in inner city Johannesburg and in many of our cities across this, in, in this country, but downtown Dar es Salaam, downtown um, Abidjan as well. There are very many cities, the level of rental accommodation is, is significant and it's informal and would cl be classified as slum. So what TUF does is it identifies leaders, potential entrepreneurs who would be small scale operators. It identifies them through character based lending and then it provides them with a loan to buy the property and refurbish it. Um, and then also with technical capacity so that they can operate themselves as a viable business. And in that way, what they're doing is they receive the big money into tough and then they disaggregate it to the smaller scale providers. 
And then for those that don't have equity, because Joe, you mentioned that as well, that there are a lot of people who would be perfectly able to participate as, as, um, as entrepreneurs, but they don't have the capital to start. So Tuff has created an equity fund where uh, they call it the Intertuco Equity Fund, where in fact that the requirement of a lender to that the borrower has equity in the property, well, that gets dealt with by the equity fund. And as the property improves in value through the investment process, can pay back the equity fund as well. And this is on the back of underperforming urban areas that need to be regenerated and improved upon. So I think there's a real opportunity there. There are other examples that exist as well about land regularization where you know informal settlements are often flat right and low density or or high density but low low structures and moving those to a smaller piece of land and building up and leveraging the land the other land value so i think what we have to find is other resources because as joe said the government has no money the private sector has has um particular conditions which would enable their ability to engage and households themselves don't have significant resources. So if we can leverage land values and then recognize the entrepreneurial capacities of, of, of small scale providers through a mechanism that disaggregates the big money, I, I won't take more time, but it's I think that's an issue that that we should look at. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. It's got to be both and. It's got to be massive and small at the same time. Um, and so that's uh, that's helpful. Thank you very much. And maybe over to you, uh, Anna Claudia. Uh, invite you from your experience uh, uh, in Latin America. Uh, where do you see, and especially following from your previous comments about uh, maximizing what exists? Do you have uh, some experiences in terms of, of promising practices uh, from your perspective? Yes, we do have. We have been actually working together and collecting those practices. This has been part of our work in partnership in Latin America, where we co-founded the Urban Housing Practitioners Hub. So we have been doing that on a daily basis. Uh, we do. I do think that we have light at the end of the tunnel. We have promising practices here. But what I believe our major challenge is, is a cultural shift. I think we started this cultural shift through the um, approval of the new urban agenda. Uh, we talk less about the new urban agenda outside of Latin America, but I think this uh, international agreement uh, gives us, provides us a guiding principles that are pretty much aligned to what Kesia, you, Stephen and Joe were talking. It talks about multi-level participatory governance. It talks about the centrality of housing, centrality of land, the importance of collecting data, you know, around uh, informal areas uh, to setting up national policies that will address, you know, the social priorities. It talks about the human rights. So I believe we started this cultural shift there, but it has to, to evolve. And for me, uh, the nature of, of the challenge that we have and the nature of the solution are of two. One is technical and the second is political. Uh, they are complementary. Uh, a lot of what Kesia was saying and, and Joe uh, was saying, the work of SDI, for me, is also a combination of also technical expertise with political mobilization. So I believe through these practices that we have been exploring through the UHPH, through the practices of um, uh, STI, Habitat for Humanity, you know, organizations that are working at the regional or global level, we have identified a sort of recipe, right? We know more or less what to do. Uh, we know that we need to have national policies that will enable uh, Islam upgrading at scale, that will enable the access to land at scale for social housing. We know that we have we need to have a diversity of housing policies from social uh, rental housing, you know, towards collective housing, cooperative housing. You know, we, we know that already. We know that we need to unlock finance at the national level. And here, again, Casey, I will disagree with you, and Joe. We do have money. Samuel Waba said that in another panel that we shared recently. We do have money. We have to prioritize this money uh, towards uh, Islam upgrading. The fiscal money is up there. It's being utilized for other things. Well, we need to reshift and prioritize this money. 
Um, we need to have the planning mechanisms. Uh, the special planning area is an excellent example. Uh, it is inspired by an example from Brazil, which is called the social interest zoning, um, set up by a national police that also uh, from, you know, 2001, that uh, also inspired a national, pol a national law in South Africa, the Spruma from 2013, that also inspired a national law in Kenya for, for, of 2016. So we have this knowledge have been you know, transitioning from uh, across ocean, across countries and regions. Uh, so we are improving the, the overall framework, you know, the enabling a regulatory and, and legal environment. And we need the political forces of these organizations, federations, these networks that are being formed, you know, to bring that, uh, to get these laws approved, to get these master plans approved, right? Uh, to make sure that the communities are on the map, to change the census, uh, we need to do that. Um, and to get that uh, to scale. So this is, is the combination that uh, that we need. Um, I can give you an example of the work that Habitat for Humanity we have been kind of supporting is doing in Paraguay, where uh, they set up a network of organizations, CPOs and NGOs, uh, Techo, other orga local organizations in Paraguay, some regional organizations, and they're currently working with the Census Institute to change the census for next year. So the Census Institute is changing, is adapting, building the methodology made based on the mapping that is available and existing, provided by Habitat for Humanity, by Tetra and other organizations. So this is happening right now, only possible because there is a network of organizations, a collective, like Stephen said, that is supporting this formal change. But there are two areas, and then I will finish with that. Two areas that we haven't tackled yet, uh, yet at scale, land and participatory governance. So we need to prioritize allocation of land, review the way we allocate and plan land in our cities, uh, um, accept the social function, social and environmental function of the land. This is also stated on the new urban agenda. So land has to respect in the property rights, but it has to have first a social function and an environmental function. And then the other aspect is participatory governance. We have negotiations, we have struggles, we have battles, but we don't have well-established institutionalized mechanisms of participation. And these are the areas that we need to change, a structural change. Thank you, that's, that's very powerful. And I love the way you described um, the recipe. Um, and also just the uh, the remaining things that need to be addressed. And I, I'm reminded of the book that was written a few years back called Why Nations Fail. And one of the key aspects was around uh, the lack of participatory governance. So that really is a, a very key aspect. Um, so I appreciate your, uh, your comments there, Anna Claudia. Stephen, over to you for uh, perhaps the last uh, uh, illustration. Uh, and then I'll just open it up. Thank you, Chris. I know our time is flying by. I'll just make two last points and, and again, appreciate the comments of, uh, of the rest of the panel. Um, uh, the first point, uh, dovetailing on, on what you're saying, Anna Claudia, our example in uh, of, of working together with uh, Cities Alliance and with SDI and others, UN Habitat and others in Liberia, where it was kind of an all in, I mean, all of the different aspects. So local, community-based participatory processes, really engaging local residents, but also working at the national government level to equip them and provide them with a policy framework that didn't exist, that would allow for the organizing capacity at the local level to have a policy context in which to hold the government accountable for their uh, commitments to um, uh, uh, slum upgrading and, and informal settlement upgrading. So, so that combination uh, is is really kind of the necessary package. No individual element is going to do it all by itself. It is a it's an all in um, uh, strategy in order to try and, and and really make progress and move the needle. Uh, Liberia was a very interesting kind of example because it was it was kind of a uh, it, it, we had there was an opportunity to work in all of those different areas simultaneously. And uh, um, uh, while I mean, it's got a long way to go, but there was significant progress made in a relatively short amount of time. So hats off to the entire coalition 
that uh, that worked on that for the last few years. The other thing I just want to mention and dovetail on, on a comment that that Joe made um, earlier, um, but the but the market capacity in uh, informal settlements is um, often underappreciated and uh, and yet uh, and under leveraged. And so, um, as, as Joe mentioned, you know, households are paying several times more than what is necessary or what would be normally paid for basic services like water or sanitation. So the capacity uh, and it is there, um, but we need to kind of think differently about uh, informal settlements as kind of in terms of their both political and financial um, and economic uh, power. And so I think if we if we think differently about uh, and, and if we're able to hold the public sector accountable and even challenge the private sector to understand that uh, informal settlements have substantial economic opportunity, the, the ability to bring together, you know, what you know, increasingly is being called people, public, private partnerships, the four P's, bringing all the actors together in a comprehensive way um, where everybody contributes and everybody sees a way for achieving their own individual goals. Those are some strategies that I think we're, we're increasingly seeing and, and increasingly drawn to. So I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and we just have a, a few minutes. I, I wish we could uh, continue on. Um, uh, I'll just invite uh, any of the panelists, uh, if you have any questions or areas of amplification, uh, Kasia, uh, over to you. Yeah, I was just noticing this comment by Joseph in our in our chat here, and and he was saying we call it up uh, informal, and we think that that's extra, but if it's the normal way of being, that's the dominant, and all of our systems are focused on on such a small segment of the population. Um, and I, I wanted to pick up a point that that Joe was making, and that I think we could discuss for much much longer is this point of data, because that changes the def one definition of informality is that it's what is not escape is what it is what escapes enumeration. So if we start to enumerate and it becomes visible, then it become we can normalize it in the minds of the policymakers and the providers of products and services. Um, and that's been such an important strategy that SDI has followed. Um, but I think it's a strategy that we all need to follow and really, really demand it. And, and then work with it and engage with that data quite explicitly. We want to make this market activity much more transparent. We need to understand the math. How does it work? All of it, because that's what will start to convince the other providers that in fact, they're way behind the ball because they're focusing on, on, on a narrow segment of, of the market itself. I think a lot of work needs to go into data and that in fact, if we do that, and it comes to your point also, Anna Claudia, is in some ways, you know, participatory governance uh, is if we we have to figure out how to get that breadth of population to be able to communicate. It's again, it's another aggregating mechanism. And we can do that with data and with technology. We can do so much more now than we could have done, you know, 10 years ago. So our expectations need to change. Um, and if we bring that in, we may be change the nature of the discussion itself, even without looking at it directly, you know? Okay. Thank you, Kasia. Um, Anna Claudia, please. Yeah, just sh two short comments because I'm also seeing the comments on the chat and some of them, I don't know, it, it gives me the understanding or the perception that there are some thoughts about eliminating informality. And I, I, I don't really think it's possible and I don't really think we should think this way uh, because it, it's huge. There are some estimates from the University of Boulder, Colorado. I don't know if you are aware of a, a research called the Atlas of Informality. Um, and the estimates are of uh, 3 billion, well, Ian Haptat also says that 3 billion uh, Islam dwellers in 2050, but half of the urban population living in informal settlements in 2050. This is a lot. Um, this is if we do nothing, and this is based on information pre-COVID. Uh, so it can be more than that. So I don't think it's feasible uh, to imagine that we'll be able to take this all and make it completely formal the way we know the formal. Maybe there will be a new formal 
which is something between, you know, the informal and the formal, but we need the formal structures to accept and embrace. For me, this is fundamental. And the second aspect, final aspect, we haven't spoken much about gender, uh, but um, it, it, it's in, I also saw the comment about that, um, empowering women through land titling, housing titling is also fundamental. So women have been surviving from the informal economy, you know, in informal land and having the security and the ownership. It's, it's very crucial for, you know, promoting gender equity at the city level, at the country level and expanding the opportunities uh, for women. So this is an aspect that I would like to call attention before we close. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. And Joe, I'll just give you uh, perhaps a minute to, uh, to intervene and, and then I'll, I'll bring us to an end. Uh, thank you. And Claudia has brought the issue of gender. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's the way the, these things are interlinked in terms of policy. So one of the aspects we are forgetting is also uh, if you look at now the climate change uh, space, we are looking at uh, what we are using as building materials, the productions of those building materials actually increase in terms of pollution in terms so there are so many initiatives here that people have come up with technology cheaper affordable uh, materials but the, our policies do not allow us to embrace those type of materials and if you look at the cause the, the corruption in the construction industry so let's look at the policies let's look at uh, how they are that was less than one minute. <laughs> thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. And I know we're over time, but uh, please allow me to thank all of our panelists for sharing uh, such a richness uh, of experience. And I, I know we could uh, continue uh, quite some time, but uh, really appreciate it. I think it was a really helpful uh, and illuminating discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you. Dean? Thank you, Chris, and to our speakers, Stephen, Kessia, Anna, Claudia and Joe for a sensational se session. It was wonderful. And a big thank you to all of our speakers on our first day and what has what a day that's been. Terrific debates on the impact of COVID on housing need and provision, how the authorities have responded, how we can build on the best responses, the moratorium on evictions, the freeing up of private sector shelter, the recognition that COVID is no respecter of housing status, and learn from and reverse the worst, the need to build political support for the full citizens right, citizen rights to service provision of those in informal settlements and empower those with insecure tenure and in, 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 in substandard living conditions. The scandal of poor residents forced to pay a poverty penalty, higher prices for basic services like water, sanitation, safe electricity in slum settlements, and if informal settlements are likely to be a reality for the foreseeable future, how can we improve the quality and sustainability of people's homes? We've looked at the tensions between local and central governments in housing provision and investment and how COVID-19 has highlighted the failures of housing provision prior to the pandemic. We've heard about ideological tensions between right to buy and need to provide social housing in Eastern European countries and how the sudden end to tourism in Europe in the pandemic highlighted the scale of housing stock lost to Airbnb and short term letting. We've heard about the impact of COVID on government debt and the need for municipal authorities to be free to borrow local capital to meet local needs. And we've heard inspiring stories about Mukuru, Nairobi's sprawling slum, where its residents were engaged by 40 organisations in a community-led Mungano Alliance to make it a transparent special planning area, collect population data, provide clean water, roads and begin the process of building new homes providing a sewerage system and the possibility of the model being replicated in other informal set settlements in Africa. We heard from India, where the Orissa government turned a crisis into an opportunity by recruiting returning migrant workers who fled the big cities during the pandemic to upgrade homes in its informal settlements. We've heard about the South African company disaggregating large funds for small loans to people to renovate residential properties and business premises in low priced city neighbourhoods. As we said at the outset today, this forum is above all about hope and finding sustainable solutions. A lot of ground has been covered today, but there's so much more to cover tomorrow on day two. We'll be looking at the impact of climate change on vulnerable populations and their housing needs, solutions to homelessness in Central and Eastern Europe, 
the role of public private partnerships and the, how what that how that can play in promoting affordable housing solutions and different challenges and approaches to housing between western and eastern europe i'm looking forward to it have a lovely evening and i'll meet you here again tomorrow morning uh, tomorrow afternoon rather at 1 p.m see you all then bye bye <laughs>